The, um, the next speaker is Eric Schwitzkabel. Um, he doesn't seem to have slides. Is that possible? Well, we do. We do have slides. Do have slides. Okay. Oh, and yes. Mara and Mara Garza. Yeah, yes. sorry. Um, so um, Eric is a um, uh, uh, professor of philosophy at UC Riverside. Um, but most philosophers will know him as the um, author of the most widely read, and I think the, by far the best philosophy of mind blog, uh, The Splintered Mind, where many uh, uh, really extremely interesting uh, topics have come up that have resulted in papers uh, 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 by Eric, uh, uh, such as a paper on why people used to dream in black and white but now seem to dream in technicolor. Um, his main interests are philosophy of psychology, philosophy of mind, moral psychology. He's also interested in classical Chinese uh, philosophy. Um, Mara is uh, a grad student in philosophy at, at Riverside, and her interests are in ethics, mind, and their intersections in moral psychology. And the, uh, uh, the title is The Rights of Artificial Intelligences. Thank you. Um, so hypothetically, we might someday create entities with human-grade artificial intelligence. And by human-grade artificial intelligence, which from now on we'll just refer to as AI for short, we mean AI that's both cognitively and emotionally similar to human beings. That is, AI who have both human-like theoretical and practical intelligence as well as a human-like capacity for joy and suffering. So today we're going to present a positive argument that human-grade AI would deserve moral considerations similar to what we owe natural human beings and perhaps even more moral consideration than we uh, normally owe to human strangers. And we're gonna suggest three imperatives for ethical AI design and discuss a puzzle case we find interesting. So here's our argument for AI rights, which we call the no relevant difference argument. Premise one, if entity A deserves some particular degree of moral consideration and entity B doesn't, does not deserve that same degree of moral consideration, there must be some relevant difference between the two entities that grounds this difference in moral status, right? And for premise two, there are possible AIs who do not differ in any such relevant respects from human beings. A conclusion, therefore, there are possible AIs who deserve a degree of moral consideration similar to that of human beings. And the conclusion here is intentionally modest. We're only saying that there are possible AIs who deserve equal moral consideration. We're not committing to technological optimism about actually creating such AIs in the foreseeable future, nor do we commit to any particular architecture that they would take. And then if desired, if you want to, you can make the argument bolder. You can strengthen it in either dimension, the first or second premise. So premise two relies on what counts as possible AIs receiving equal moral consideration. So we might strengthen it by more narrowly specifying what types of entities would deserve moral consideration. For example, somebody who's an enthusiast about simulated realities might argue that there's possible AIs who live entirely in simulations and who nonetheless deserve equal moral consideration. And then premise one relies on there being a relevant difference and you might make the argument bolder by narrowing what types of differences are relevant differences. For example, you might argue that material constitution is never relevant unless there's gonna be some psychological or social difference that goes along with that material difference. And for example, the fact that some possible AIs are virtual may not count as a relevant difference from humans to diminish their moral status. So this no relevant difference argument suggests a kind of test of moral status, which we call a difference test. The difference test is a type of moral argumentative challenge. If you're going to regard one entity as deserving uh, greater moral consideration than another, then you ought to be able to point to a relevant difference between these entities that justifies that differential treatment and an inability to provide such justification opens you up to suspicions of chauvinism or bias. So 
there are um, possible objections to even the modest, unstrengthened version of our no relevant difference argument. And here are three objections to the second premise in our brief replies. So there's this objection from psychological difference. According to this objection, all possible AIs would be importantly psychologically different from natural human beings in a way that would prevent them from deserving equal moral status. For example, they might inevitably lack free will or consciousness or human-like creative insight. And our reply, well, the objection overestimates the difference between us and possible future AIs who might be designed along very different lines than current AIs. So future AI systems might involve artificially grown biological or semi-biological systems, chaotic systems, evolved systems, um, artificial brains, and so on. And even researchers such as John Searle and Roger Penrose, who are famously skeptical about conscious AI designed using architectures that are currently popular, even they allow that future very different architectures might generate artificial beings who have as much or as little free will, consciousness, and creativity as natural human beings have. So for the next objection, this objection from duplicability. So the objection might be something like AIs would be duplicable in a way that natural human beings aren't. So that destroying an AI is less of a tragedy than destroying a human being. And our reply to the objection is maybe duplicability does reduce this moral worth of something, but there are possible AIs so complex that they would be no more duplicable than a human being. Or it might also be someday possible to duplicate natural human beings, in which case that argument would lose its force. And then finally, um, in some cases, duplicability, you could think of it as increasing the moral worth of something, for example, if one entity is a planned template for making 10,000 more, then destroying that one might be more of a tragedy than destroying another entity that can't be duplicated. And then um, the objection from otherness. So according to this objection, since we're human beings, we owe a special duty to the human species. Thus, there'll always be a difference between us humans and them AI. And reply. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Reflection on hypothetical cases reveals this to be kind of obnoxious if intended as a general principle. So you can suppose, you can imagine that there was somebody psychologically similar to us in every way, blamelessly thrown, put into our society from infancy, and ign ignorant of its status as an AI, and maybe unknown to everyone around, including herself, this being had been artificially grown in a vat um, rather than from human DNA. Um, and is so, because of that, not a member of our biological species, or maybe has an artificially constructed brain, but one that works just like ours, with the same kinds of thoughts and feelings and conscious experience. So it would be a cruel mistake to demote such a being from full moral considerability simply upon discovering this artificial nature or origin. And then here's a fourth objection, this objection from existential debt. So suppose you build a fully human-grade intelligent robot, fully conscious, fully capable of human levels of joy and suffering, full of long-term hopes for its future. And suppose now that this human-grade robot costs you $10 a month to maintain. You maintain it for a couple of years, but then after a while you decide you'd rather spend the $10 a month on a magazine subscription. So you decide to dismantle and delete the robot. Learning of your plan, however, the robot complains, hey, I'm just a being as worthy of continued existence as you are. You can't just kill me for the sake of a magazine subscription. And suppose you reply, you ingrate, you owe your very life to me. You should be thankful just for the time I've given you. I owe you nothing if I choose to spend my money differently. It's my money to spend. So the core idea of this objection from existential debt is that artificial intelligence, because it's made by us, owes its existence to us, and thus it can be terminated or subjugated at our pleasure without moral wrongdoing, as, wrong, as long as its existence overall has been worthwhile. And um, now consider this possible argument in defense of eating humanely raised me and see like how it might be different. So a steer, let's suppose, leads a happy life grazing on lush hills. It wouldn't have existed at all if the rancher hadn't been planning to kill it for meat. 
Its death for meat appears to be a condition of its existence, so seen as a package deal, the rancher having brought it into existence and then killed it is overall morally acceptable. But then, or imagine a religious person dying of cancer who doesn't believe in an afterlife. She might console herself by thinking, overall, her life has been good. She's grateful, so God has given her nothing to resent. And so analogously, the ar argument might go, your robot's continuation at your pleasure was a condition of its very existence, why it came into existence. Um, so it has nothing to resent. So we're not sure how this argument works for non-human animals raised for meat, but we reject this argument, from, this objection from existential debt for human grade AI. We think the case is closer to this clearly morally odious case, which Eric will continue with. All right, so, all right, so, um, Suppose that Anna and VJ decide to get pregnant and have a child. The child lives happily for his first eight years. On his ninth birthday, Anna and VJ decide they'd prefer not to pay any further expenses for the child so that they can have a boat instead. No one can easily be found to care for the child, so they kill him painlessly. But it's okay, they argue, just like the steer, just like the robot, they wouldn't have had the child, let's suppose, had they known they'd be on the hook for supporting it all the way up till his 18th birthday. The child's support at their pleasure was a condition of its very existence. Overall, its life has been worthwhile. It has nothing to resent. Um, so we hope that you'll agree that their thinking uh, isn't a good example of oral thinking. Uh, their decision to have a child carries with it a responsibility for the child. It's not a decision to be made lightly and then undone, although in some sense the child owes its existence to Anna and VJ. That's not a callable debt that can be vacated by this then discontinuing the child's existence. So our thought is that um, for an important range of possible AIs, the situation would be similar. If we bring into existence genuinely conscious, human-grade artificial intelligence, fully capable of joy and suffering, with a full human range of theoretical and practical intellig intelligence with expectations of future life, then we make a moral decision approximately as significant and irrevocable as the decision to have a child. So we're inclined, in other words, uh, to flip the objection from existential debt on its head. If we intentionally bring a human-grade AI into existence, we put ourselves into a social relationship that carries responsibility for the AI's welfare. We take upon ourselves the burden of supporting it, or at least sending it out into the world with a fair shot at a satisfactory existence. So, artificial beings, if they're psychologically similar to natural human beings in consciousness, creativity, emotionality, self-conception, morality, rationality, fragility, all that stuff, they warrant substantial moral consideration in virtue of that fact alone. If, furthermore, we are also responsible for their existence and their features, then they have a moral claim on us that otherwise similar human strangers would not have to the same degree. All right, so that's our uh, primary argument for the moral status of AIs. Uh, now we're going to suggest three imperatives of ethical AI design, and then we'll conclude with a puzzle case. All right, so uh, the epistemology of consciousness is quite a tangle, especially the epistemology of the consciousness or not of hypothetical future AIs. All right, suppose that you create a sophisticated machine that's capable of some sophisticated and intelligent seeming behavior. Is it conscious? Does it have a real stream of experience? Is it capable of genuine joy and suffering? On almost every view of morality, these facts about it would be morally relevant to its uh, moral status. So if it's hard to know what kind of conscious experience it would or would not have, 
then it would be hard to know what our moral obligations to that AI would be, right? So that kind of difficult epistemology then invites uh, three related imperatives of AI design that we want to suggest. One is, if we are going to continue to make intelligent and sophisticated AIs, then we should simultaneously prioritize research into the nature of consciousness and the conditions under which we could reasonably expect that genuine joy and suffering would emerge from complex systems. Otherwise, we might accidentally create conscious beings without realizing that we're doing so. Or alternatively, we might think we've made conscious beings without actually having done so. And either possibility invites moral catastrophe. We should also consider a second principle, which we call the uh, design policy of the excluded middle. According to this policy, we should only design artificial intelligences whose moral status is clear one way or another. Right? We should either design AI that's simple enough that we know that it doesn't merit serious moral concern and can be deleted at will, or alternatively, we should create AI that, whose moral status we know deserves respect and then give it its due. Violating the excluded middle policy means creating moral AI whose moral status is unclear. Uh, this would then create an unfortunate dilemma, right? So the dilemma would be either you give this dubious AI full moral rights you think it might deserve, or you give it diminished rights. If you give it the full rights, and it doesn't in fact have consciousness enough to merit, or sophistication enough to merit uh, the level of moral concern that you give it, then you might be sacrificing real human interests for something that doesn't have interests worth that sacrifice. But on the flip side, if you give the AI diminished rights, when in fact it might really deserve full rights, then you risk perpetrating slavery and murder without realizing that you're doing so. Here's a third design policy. We call this the emotional alignment design policy. And the idea here is that you want to design artificial intelligence to provoke an appropriate range of emotional responses from ordinary users, neither too much nor too little. Now, suppo just suppose that researchers eventually figure out tricky questions about what types of AI do and do not deserve serious moral consideration. We shouldn't create an AI that deserves serious moral consideration and then put it into a bland box with a poor user interface that tempts people to disregard its status. Uh, conversely, we shouldn't create AI that generates a powerful impression in ordinary users of deserving serious moral consideration if that AI is not really sophisticated enough to deserve that moral consideration. So for example, suppose you create an AI without consciousness, uh, but which ordinary users react to as though it's really conscious, really deserves consideration, and now there's an accident in which both that AI and a normal natural human are both in mortal danger. Right? You wouldn't want an ordinary user to rush to save the beloved but unsophisticated, non-conscious AI and let the ordinary human die. Right? So our emotional responses to AI should be neither too high nor too low. Now, in um, Douglas Adams' novel, The Restaurant at the End of the Universe, there's this scene in which this protagonist, Arthur Dent, is given a chance to meet the meat. He's uh, an uplifted, intelligent steer, uh, ambles up to him in a posh restaurant, and starts talking how, about how delicious he is and what cart the cuts of him would be, the, would, the, would be the tenderest, right? And the idea is Arthur's going to pick out a slice of this steer, and then the steer's going to go in the back room and shoot himself for Arthur's dinner. Arthur, naturally enough, finds this prospect unappetizing. <laughs> or here's another example. Uh, consider a human-grade android that's sent on a dangerous scientific mission alongside several natural humans to be capable of astute uh, scientific and practical reasoning and smooth social interaction. This AI is given a normal complement of human emotions, except for one difference. 
It radically deprioritizes the continuation of its own existence compared to the continuation of the other humans and the completion of the scientific mission. Without qualm or resentment, this AI would uh, sacrifice itself if that meant a 5% increase in the likelihood of one human surviving or if it meant that the data collected at the end of the mission would be higher quality. We might imagine both Arthur's meat and the scientific android are pre-designed to want nothing more than to commit suicide on our behalf if that's what it takes to meet their goals. Right? The uh, steer desperately wants to kill itself to be someone's dinner. The scientific android would desperately wants to kill itself to avoid a small risk to natural humans or the, or the uh, scientific mission. So we think two interesting ethical questions arise from this. One is, is it ethical to design genuinely conscious human-grade AIs in this way so that they want to commit suicide on our behalf? And the other is, if they are somehow created, should we attempt to prevent their suicide as we would normally attempt to present, prevent the suicide of a human being? Uh, so we're not sure how to answer those questions. We're gonna leave time, we wanna leave time for discussion. Uh, so we're just putting these out there as worth some thought. But we do wanna um, conclude with one other thought which is uh, a possible fourth ethical design principle. We think that in the case of the steer, uh, what makes us recoil maybe is that the steer doesn't seem to properly value its own life. There's something wrong, it seems, in its wanting to commit suicide simply to become someone else's dinner. It's not as clear to us that there's wrong with some, something else, something similarly wrong with the scientific android case, but maybe so. And either way, we're thinking uh, of maybe we should consider this fourth design principle, which we call the self-respect design principle. And that would be, if human-grade AIs are some someday created, uh, they should be created with an appropriate appreciation of their own value and moral status. Thank you. Hi, um, Julian Pigelius, how are you? Um, so, looking at this, um, what you're saying here, at the last slide, yeah. shouldn't the obvious ethical question be the opposite? Is it moral to create an Android or create any AI that actually values its own existence? It would seem to be more moral to design something like a research Android that can be happy and then successfully terminate when the mission is over. That would allow perfect happiness. I mean, it's just, I guess it's just testing this intuition. like. With a human being, you would say, no, you know, you need to value your own existence. You don't want to destroy yourself. Um, and that, and then why, I don't know, why, you might say, okay, they don't have this desire to live, but they have it in their interest to live. So then why with the AI can't you say the same thing? Is it because they don't belong to a species where everybody, you know, you think everybody should do that or that seems to be the standard? It just seems difficult to say, like, why you would say it in one case with your fellow human, but not say it in the other case if they're essentially the same except for that difference. And it could be an artificially intelligent creature that's organic. I mean, it might just look like a human, have a brain very similar to a human, just be artificially built. Um, so I don't know, like that intuition might then, if it seems that human like it might, you know, might be more sympathetic to it. So th there are two reasons why we don't kill people generally, right? One is, uh, you know, we attempt for moral reasons to minimize uh, human suffering. But the other one is also because there's another other moral reason, which is that we kind of, you know, increase the entropy of the universe if we delete a complex organism, basically. That uh, all the information that, you know, was created in the brain and the being of that, uh, of that person disappears when that person dies. Um, it may not be the case for, for androids or robots or AI systems in the sense that they may have multiple bodies with one mind that survives the death of a body. So in that case, the, the moral uh, consequence of, you know, perhaps they will still have suffering when one of their bodies dies, 
uh, but the increased entropy uh, is, is limited to their physical body, not to their mind, which will, which will survive. And so, so the, the, the cost of uh, the, the physical dilution, as opposed to the dilution of the entire mind, uh, is, is considerably uh, less. Um, so, what, you know, it's a completely different situation as, as, as humans. Yeah, so I would agree with that. So I would say if the AI is, continues as a mind uh, when its body is destroyed and then can be re-embodied later, that wouldn't actually be killing the AI. Yeah, so that wouldn't then be a case of murder. That would be maybe an inconvenience or something, yeah. Uh, hi, uh, lo loved your talk. Um, so I'm wondering if there are cases where our intuitions will fail, but there are still moral imperatives. Uh, in particular, uh, the caring capacity of the universe for artificial minds is vast, almost beyond imagining. And someone could argue that there is a moral imperative to allow this process of expansion to unfold. In this process, we might be faced with different kinds of mind crime where our intuitions would tell us that it's unacceptable, but the potential payoff might be worth it overall. This seems like a very thorny issue, and I was wondering what your thoughts were. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I think that our moral intuitions were uh, built up out of materials in our evolutionary history and our social cultural history and our developmental history. And they're tuned to a certain limited range of circumstances in which most of the beings who uh, we interact with who are similar to us in uh, one dimension of complexity are also similar to us in other dimensions of complexity. There's certain maxima to uh, uh, the possibility of joy and the rationality of the beings around us. Right, so there's a very limited range of environments in which our moral intuitions were cultivated. Um, once we break out of those environments, it's natural to suspect that our moral intuitions will start to break down. Um, but the problem is, uh, in my view, <laughs> we don't have a good epistemology for figuring out what the moral truth is once our intuitions start to break down. Right, so this puts us in a difficult uh, uh, position to see through those issues. Um, yeah, question here. <coughs> uh, to paraphrase uh, Jeremy Bentham, um, I think he said, uh, it doesn't matter whether or not it has qualia, but whether or not it can suffer. Um, and another famous person said, no, no brain, no pain, which I agree with. But I don't think it works in, in the reverse, no pain, no brain. I mean, you can, you can have you know, uh, pain without, you can have a brain without pain. Um, how much weight would you put on uh, the ability to suffer, the capacity for suffering, as opposed to just consciousness or internal experience? And if so, why not design a machine that doesn't have a somatosensory cortex or a limbic system? Um, so in this paper and in general, we're trying to be pretty broad about uh, what the basis for uh, moral patiency or moral considerability would be. So we're kind of just trying to load everything in, <laughs> right? Consciousness and suffering and rationality and all that kind of stuff and say, let's assume that you've got all that stuff. Now, if you then say, okay, well, which is the really important stuff in there? That's a question that uh, I don't think we're, Amara and I are prepared to answer uh, right now. That's not part of our project at, the, at this moment. Uh, hi, thank you for that talk. Um, uh, my name's Tracy Lau, and um, I don't see sorry, you. I'm oh, over okay. here. <laughs> um, and yeah, I wanted to, uh, I noticed you were asking about consciousness and about um, that's one of the prerequisites for moral consideration. And I know Christoph Koch, who's one of the you know world's experts in consciousness, that believes it's a continuum, and so animals do have consciousness to varying degrees. Um, given that, as a human species, we've completely failed in terms of coming up with you know, solutions like cultured meat. I, I know that the funding for that is very poor right now. Um, we haven't developed technologies to uh, prevent us inflicting a lot of suffering on billions of animals. Given this, well, in my opinion, a massive failure, um, what are your fears uh, about how, and I think the work you're doing is incredibly important, but the fear that they're not going to be protected because they may not be in a position of power. And if we look on how animals are treated, it's, well, you know, I think it's a failure. And is, are we just going to bring that forward into our treatment of AIs? Why don't you, you want to take this one, Mara? Well, 
I mean, I guess that's what what like a paper like this would try to set out maybe is some um, anticipation. Like instead of having some crisis where you enslave a bunch of robots or you have a bunch of androids and they slowly, maybe after several versions, finally get to, to a state where they would have as much status as an animal, let's say. Um, I guess you'd want to be prepared for that. Because even, I mean, I think human like human grade AI is interesting, but also it could be like the case that you would want to give them as much as animal rights like earlier on or something like that. So it's good to anticipate that definitely. Yeah, and I think, um, and I would also uh, affirm your point about um, the power relationship. So currently, the power relationship is that we're the designers and so we're the bosses and the legal framework is their property and stuff like that, right? So if you just kind of assume that as the um, kind of social starting point, then it seems like it would be natural that um, if AI were created, it would be in some sort of uh, subservient position, which might be problematic. Okay, I'm, I'm afraid we're going to have to uh, stop here for some questions. <laughs> so you're Ronald Sandler, okay, hi. Okay, you're going to start? Yeah. Okay, so our next speakers 